Welcome to a special episode of the Crypto Bullseye Show, the making of the crypto tax blueprint. Former Let's Talk Bitcoin host and voice actor Dr. Stephanie Murphy did an amazing work to bring my book to life in audiobook format. She will be the only person who is as intimate as I am with this material and through her art of narration. Therefore, I invited her to join me in a fireside chat to talk about the golden nuggets within the book and in the crypto space. So we ended up meandering into self-reliance, homesteading, and more where everything seemed to circle back to crypto. So our conversation was so good, we kept it rolling and then they ended up splitting it into two parts. So hold on to your seat and I hope you enjoy this extended talk. All right, Stephanie, it's great to talk to you again. It's been, it's been a long time, years. Yeah, I think I think the last time we saw each other was in the pre-COVID era at a conference when there was conferences. Yeah, that was the the blockchain conference in Denver is when that yep. was. August. And then unfortunately, one thing about that conference is they had the big party and I had to take off to go to another event. So I missed oh. the whole party. Oh, I think I might have missed the party too, because I think oh, really? I also had to leave early for some reason. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I was going to say I could have seen you there, but maybe you weren't there after all. Probably not. But I remember, um, you know, you I went to your talk and I think you went to my talk too. And um, we were at that time, um, you know, we were both uh, speakers at that conference. And um, I had narrated your previous audio book, The Ultimate Bitcoin Business Guide. And um you know, for, for your listeners who don't know who I am, I'm uh, Stephanie Murphy. I'm a voice actor and, um, that's not all I am. I, I'm much more complex than that. I have a, there's I have so a very, many things. Yes. Yeah, so, I'm so many things. I have a very interesting background, but, um, you know, uh, I've been doing voice acting for about 10 years and I have my own business. I'm a solo entrepreneur and I really love that. Um, but I was also like really early interested in, um, Bitcoin, because that's all there was at the time. And then, you know, it, it branched out and it became many different uh, cryptocurrencies and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I got interested in Bitcoin really early, like around 20, 2012. And I, I just caught the bug. Like I was really excited about it and I wanted to learn everything I could about it. Um, and I ended up being a host of this show. At the time, I was like doing some podcasting and I was also transitioning out of my previous career as a scientist. Um, and I was, uh, I was doing some podcasts and radio shows and, you know, just learning a lot about Bitcoin. And I ended up being part of a show called Let's Talk Bitcoin, which later became Speaking of Bitcoin. Um, and I ended up being on that podcast for like about nine years or something. And anyway, so um, I'm, I'm getting on a tangent a little well, bit. Yes, but the legendary Let's Talk Bitcoin podcast. Yeah, th that's like a little bit from my background, but the point of this all was like I, I was saying I'm a voice actor and I narrated um, your previous audiobook as well as the book we're going to talk about today, which is the Crypto Tax Blueprint. Um, and I actually, you know, I started my own business back in 2013 and I was also involved with the, you know, the Bitcoin community. And I started using Bitcoin as part of my business like really early on. Um, and so what you were writing about was really helpful. It's like you were on the cutting edge of how to integrate, like how to integrate um, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency into a business and actually like keep track of it and do the accounting and stuff. And, um, and you know, like how do you treat it for tax purposes? Like, you know, not, not most people's favorite subject, but it's important to know about that if you're going to run a business and you're going to use cryptocurrency or Bitcoin. So um, yeah. I, I, I thought it was really interesting. And you were also an early fan of this podcast, Let's Talk Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, we were- Huge fan. The hosts were acquainted with you from the beginning. <laughs> and you were, you mean, were like one like, of our first guests. That was like guests, my proving ground. Weren't you? I mean, that's where I got a lot of, most of my intel. That was, and there weren't many po other podcasts at the time. Yeah, you were also like really early into Bitcoin, weren't you? And you also had kind of a similar story. Like I, I, you were saying before we started to record that- um, you're interested in woodworking and that you built a shelf behind you. And I thought that was really cool. Um, and wasn't that like part of how you got into Bitcoin? Like, didn't you get offered to sell some, one of your pieces for it or something, or I don't know. Um, no, no. My, well, first of all, I can see you're, you're like a mega OG going back to, to 2012, but uh, 
Yeah, no, my, my origin story is actually just a quickie on that. Everybody still seems to like that, but I was actually in Utah in October of 2013. And so what I would do is my thing was whenever I went to the airport, I would grab a Wall Street Journal, right? Mm -hmm. So, because I had a, a subscription before what do. would happen is they would, all these newspapers would pile up. So I was just like, you know what, when you're at the airport, you just get one newspaper, you can read it while you're on the plane. So it so happened on the way back to Philadelphia was the breaking story about the Silk Road, the FBI bust of the Silk Road. And we all know about that story. So it tangentially mentioned Bitcoin because obviously that was, you know, the main story wasn't about Bitcoin, but obviously Bitcoin is part of that story. And so, but it didn't trigger me to be like, oh man, what's this Bitcoin thing? And like go down and start going down the rabbit hole then. But what happened was just roll the clock forward a couple of months and there I was uh, with a friend who said, hey, I want some, I want to ask you for some advice. You know, my husband and I want to spend a thousand dollars on a computer and mine some Bitcoin. And my highly skeptical mind went to, well, you don't know what you're talking about. You better get your facts straight. That's, that's like, that's, that's crazy talk. What are you, you know, what are you talking about? Of course, I'm the one who didn't know what he was talking about, but basically. And were you that, a CPA at that time? Yeah. You were already like a, yeah. a traditional CPA. Yeah. That's why I say my highly, I mean, I think I already, you know, my DNA, I'm already have the highly skeptical mind, but then add in the CPA, because when you talk about professional skepticism, you yeah. know, so it's like, I'm like, you know, skeptical on steroids, I guess. <laughs> so I was like, what are you talking about? This is crazy. I didn't know what he, I didn't know what I was talking about, but that question actually led me down the rabbit hole. And so that's what, that's one of my little pieces of advice. I say, you know, be aware in every moment because somebody might ask you a single, a single question that changes the entire trajectory of your life, because that's what happened is I went way down the rabbit hole and I actually ended up writing the book. So what happened was I was taking some courses. I was looking to do a book project. And there was like, a, you know, one of these gurus that was talking about how to look for niches on Amazon and stuff like that. And, and uh, you know, find a niche, write a book, one that's not, does, it's not too, you know, doesn't have too many uh, book titles in the area, but one that's not like totally brand new, like finding something like a sweet spot. And so what happened was she mentioned, that, I was like, oh, that's trigger. Oh, Bitcoin. Maybe that's a good one. So I went and start, I went and bought all these Bitcoin books on Amazon to start researching. And that's basically what happened. I just went way down the rabbit hole. Uh huh. Okay. And, yeah. And then went super deep because then I was like, you know, writing the book, like spent 14 and 15 writing the book we were just talking about the ultimate Bitcoin business guide. And if it really, if it wasn't for that, I mean, I think it compressed the amount of time that I bounced around down on the rabbit hole just because it was like, you really got to know stuff if you want to write about it. And, you know, plus an interest in technology. So that that's the origin story. And then that's, you know, here we are. Yeah. And I bet that you actually got a chance to practice what you preach, I guess, because I, I would imagine that you started getting clients and people wanting advice about using Bitcoin in their business, like right away. And you probably started, you know, getting paid in your business. <laughs> and Basically, so yeah, you, just, it morphed. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. We were, yeah. we were focused on just previous, just prior to that, really developing like a virtual outsourced accounting type of a business. And then, so it just, it just morphed into this niche practice in this area. So, you know, including basically being a, you know, turn into a full on like DeFi crypto degen along the way, you know, in addition to focusing really a hundred percent in the crypto space. I mean, that's all I do. I live, eat, and breathe crypto, you know, around the clock still today. Yeah. I, there's, and there's been so much, so obviously so much has changed over the last 10 years and more, uh, of course, um, this is a little more than 10 years, but um, like, how did you get into DeFi and what, like, when did you start learning about that? Because that adds well, a whole other layer. Like as you talk yes, about in is. your books, it adds another layer of complexity to any kind of accounting issues that you come across. Yeah, that is that is a really great question. I'll tell you about how that is for me because I think it's a good story. So I remember this is, uh, let's see. Well, it was the DeFi summer, which was 2020. And so, you know, COVID had happened and everything hit the fan around March of 2020. And then so- it was about, you know, six months. I was holed up like a lot of other people. And then it was like, you know, we got to get out of here. So basically we just like pulled out the air, the Airbnb dart boards and threw a dart. It just picked this little kind of podunk, podunk town somewhere in New York. 
and then just drove up there with no with no plan whatsoever other than just to get to change the scenery. Right? Wow, you went to New York like at the beginning of the <laughs> pandemic. Like, oh, was it? Well, this is sorry. This this is like August of twenty twenty. It's like six months later after not okay. going anywhere for six months out of my house. You know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then it was like, all right, let's change the scenery. Just go to this Airbnb. Literally, there was no plan other than to just, you know, leave town. And so during that week was when, you know, because I'm like reading the news every day and stuff like that. During that week was when you started hearing all these crazy stories. And um, I'm trying to remember which one, which protocol it was that, uh, oh man, I can't, it's not coming to me right now. But there was all kinds of crazy stuff that was happening during that week. And that's what really caught my attention. It just seemed like that was when DeFi was really hitting the news. I was like, what is this thing? I was like, am I missing something here? Or what's going on? So I came back and then in September, that's when there was several other new protocols that, that launched and stuff. Cause it's kind of like these projects were like launching left and right. And then, I mean, some of these were crazy. You would go from like, sometimes in three or four days, it would go from zero to hundreds of millions of dollars in liquidity. Like, because people were like doing this farming and jumping around and, trying to get yield and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. Oh yeah. The yield farming. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, Swerve. That was the one I first tried was this, is this project called Swerve that uh -huh. didn't last very long actually, but it, but I think, yeah, it, I think I vaguely remember that vaguely. Yeah. yeah I remember it was great. Cause I remember I, I need, I want to capture this guy's uh, one of the creators of that. It was great. He had this little thing like uh, no preferential cheat, no preferential treatment, uh, no pre-sales, no this, no that. You know, and it was signed John fucking deer, you know, I thought that was awesome. Cause it wasn't, you know, with everybody like self-serving in these projects and all these kind of shenanigans, this guy was like, this is how we're doing this project. And so, but I mean, I think they got, I don't know, three, four, $500 million or something like that. And again, it didn't last very long, but it was like, all right, let me try this, you know, started experimenting with it and put some funds in there. And then all of a sudden, you know, by the time you go through. I don't know, three, four, five hops or however many hops it takes and to pay the gas fees. It's like, damn, I mean, it, like you can't even do it for a thousand dollars to test it out because you're losing hundreds of dollars in the process. So I was like, so anyway, after that, I was like, I don't understand this thing. What's going on here? Like, what are these people talking? Like, it wasn't working for me, but I just kept digging and digging. And then suddenly it was like, you know, just getting deeper and deeper into it. I was like, damn, this is cool. I mean, it was like, it's fun. And you know, and there's a lot of, lot of money and a lot of other things to be made, but there's a lot, you can, you know, you can mess up and crash and burn as well, but it's the, it's the thrill of it all is what was really fun. So. Yeah, it, it is exciting. And it feels like something totally new and different. <laughs> I get so, it. Yeah. So yeah, I, I love it. And uh, it's still fun, but you know, like focusing on the crypto tax blueprint, um, the uh, the degen part of me got a little dusty and a little rusty. Some. Um, <laughs> <laughs> How did you get rusty in like two years? <laughs> well, it was well, it was really the the book project started two years ago, but then it was it, that ended up on the shelf. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was more like the last six months were really driving the book uh, this book project home. So it was really the last oh. few months I got a little rusty, not really rusty, but just not in action, you know. So I'm I'm fired back up again. I see. Okay. Well, I, I get that. I mean, I, I've narrated like over 150 audiobooks, but it's probably more at this point, but, um, but I've never actually authored a book myself, although that's something that I've been interested in. And I've started a couple of books, book drafts, and I have real trouble following through and finishing. Cause I always get busy with other things and distracted. And, um, you know, I have a lot of different interests and stuff. And, um, mm. so Maybe someday I, I will follow through, but I, I understand how difficult it is to actually go across the finish line with a project like a book. Um, even with audiobooks, it's difficult sometimes, you know, like I've had audiobooks mm. that took me more than a year to finish or or years to finish, you know. Um, so and I, hopefully wow. I'm, you know, I'll finish them all. <laughs> I finished yours in, in, in pretty fast time, actually. Like yours was like a month or six weeks or something. <laughs> oh, wow. So. Okay. Yeah, you're right. It is, it is hard to get a book project across the finish line. Yeah. And, and I've thought about this, that if somebody said, Hey, if somebody was asking for advice on like something along the lines of like, how can I turn my life around or what can I do to move myself forward or whatever, I'd say do a book project because there's so many things that open up and really, you know, you could have a book project where you're 99% of the way done. 
Like you're literally right at the end. And of course, writing it is one thing. Then there's a whole nother thing to actually get it produced into a book. And then of course, after that is actually marketing it. And that's a whole nother thing there. But just the, if you just focus on the manuscript piece, you could literally be done with that 99.5% of the way there. And if you don't finish that live, that past the, I mean, the last 0.5%, you actually have nothing. Because totally. It's yeah. It's anyway. like the real artist ship kind of thing. Like, yeah, that's one thing that when I started doing this as a business, I, I always knew that, that I would have to really pay attention to that because it's like, yeah, if you don't get something over the finish line and you don't have something to actually sell, then you're not going to make any money because you don't have a product. So I, I get it. And the audiobooks are really similar. Like um, when I was working on yours, like I finished recording it within a couple of weeks or like maybe a month at most, but then, then it took me like another couple of weeks to do all these little corrections. Like, you know, mm. just making sure it's word perfect. And it's, it's like every, you know, I understood every sentence correctly and listening and making sure, you know, that it's quality and it, it sounds good. And it's like conveying what I thought that you meant by what you wrote and everything. So it's, you know, it's, it can be a big, a big project, but we did it. We got it over the finish yeah. line, the, the, the book That's and like the, the audio book punch list for everything in life, you know, like the, like the new, like the new construction house. And then there's the punch list. It's like the perpetual yeah. punch list you Yeah, know, try to get it done. Well, but it's done now. So it's, it's on, um, the book is going to be what, well, but the time this is released, I don't think it's up right now, but it's going to be, um, on audible.com, right. Uh, the audio book, and it's already available on Kindle for people to buy if they want to. Yes, it should be any day now. And it might be right here in this very moment that yeah. the audiobook is officially like approved and published there. And so, yes, the recommendation is, is because such, since you do such a great work in bringing these things to life that, you know, go get the audiobook. But then in conjunction, go get yourself a nice hard copy. And put that you know what I recommend well. to people because your because your book is very heavy on. OK, so. I guess we should explain, like, if people aren't familiar with the book, Kirk has written this book called The Crypto Tax Blueprint, which is really informative. Like, I don't think anyone else is doing what you're doing, Kirk. And you have this paragraph at the very beginning in the intro that says, like, no, this was not written by AI. Chat GPT would not even know where to begin to write a book like this. This is like real human expertise. And that's totally true. And there's like you go through the concepts of like, how do you organize? Like if you're trying, if you're a business or an individual, like how do you organize all these crypto transactions and pay taxes on them? And like, you go through examples as well. Like you, you have characters, like there's Alice, there's Bob, there's Dimitri. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, you know, they all have kind of like a different profile and, you know, they've made various, like, you know, they've had the various things happen to them. They, they lose data from long ago in the past. They have multiple different wallets. They have data from their wallets that isn't in the right format to import into other software. And so how do they get all of this organized and just get a handle on it. And I think like anyone who's ever dealt with this kind of data, like it feels overwhelmed by it. And so you try to, your job is like making that easy and understandable. And one of the biggest points that you make is that even if you try to hire a professional to like deal with your crypto taxes for you, right? You are going to end up doing most of the work because you're the one who has that data. And this is like, when you when you're talking about be your own bank or be, you know take take responsibility for your finances like you with that with that being your own bank and taking responsibility you have to take responsibility for the data and keeping records about it um or you might end up you know paying more taxes than you really need to or losing track of important information or exposing yourself to risk or whatever and so like you are going to end up doing most of the work anyway. And Kirk shows you how to do it right. And he gives you lots of examples. And so the point I wanted to make from the beginning of this, this whole rant is like, you should get the audiobook and the text because there's numbers in there and there's like math and there's, there's examples that there's a, there's a way that you can buy the Kindle book and then you can add on the audiobook and you can listen and read it at the same time. I think that would be really helpful if you're really like following along with these examples, because, you know, it, it helps to see the, 
it to see the examples, but to also hear them at the same time, you're just going to get the information that much more uh, in that much more of a rich format, I guess. Yeah, well, now that you're talking about how to maximize the learning there, I guess the other thing to point out would be that there's also links mentioned in the book for supplemental information. So mm -hmm. the crypto tax blueprint dot zone front slash supplement, uh, sorry, crypto bullseye dot zone front slash the crypto tax blueprint. So yeah, a, I mean, I'm sure you put the link in the video description, right? In. You're going to put the link in the video description, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So that is a way to continue to get value from it as there's updates, as there's, let's say, breaking news or new resources available. So it's not like the book does, just doesn't stop in static format. You have access to getting all these other things and even some of the worksheets and all that stuff. I mean, that's valuable unto itself, just just there. So there's a whole, again, there's a whole package to it, but that was a Yeah, great definitely. You have, because, these, you have these templates that I think would be really right. helpful. Yeah several several worksheets and several templates and everything like that so uh so it's interesting because what i was thinking is you as the voice actor um that you know there's only one other person that's ever going to be as intimate with this material as i am and that's you and actually in a different way because you know you keep looking at the same thing over and over again your perspective changes so you have this kind of fresh perspective where you brought it to life, but there's not, there's not going to be any other person that's ever as intimate with the material. I think that's true with every audio book between author and, you know, voice actor. But uh, the other thing to point out too here is I think the subtitle is important because this is the, this is really the, the hook. I mean, I did make a hook out of it, right? But it's the crypto tax blueprint, how to avoid expensive crypto tax mistakes and audit proof your tax return. And mm -hmm. I think that speaks to people like, oh yeah, you know, I want that. Yeah. There, people want to do that. There's yeah. our book right there. Got to hold that up. So anyway, yeah, that's why I was really excited to talk to you about this, but just because of to see how your perspective comes out when you talk about it, which is interesting because you just brought up a couple of main points, which is the thing about even if you wanted to hire a professional, like somebody could say, I have an unlimited amount of money, like because some people, their brain is just not wired for the for admin type stuff. And they yeah. just, I don't want to do it. I'll actually pay. I have a blank check. I'll pay whatever it takes for me not to have to do it. So my assertion is you can't do that. That's impossible to do it. You're relegated. That's why I call it relegation. You get relegated to doing it yourself. And then the question is, where do you end up in the relegation zone? Which I would say just for illustration purposes, it's like 50, 50 to start out with. Now it could be higher or lower. What that means is if you did hire a professional, you're relegated to 50% of the process. But I would say it's, pro it's probably actually higher than that. Well, let's just say, that's a starting yeah. point. Okay. I, I would, so. it might even be like, I don't know, you know better, but it might even follow the 80, 20 rule, which is another thing that you talk about in the book, which is like, basically like, you know, you can do like 80% of the work to track all your crypto spending and, and um, receivables and stuff. Um, and, and then like the last 20% is going to, is going to take like the most work to actually sort out and like get correct and everything. And that's just kind of a, a rule of life where a lot of things follow that. Yeah. Could you, for listeners, could you just explain the Pareto 80, 20, the Pareto principle, the 80, 20. Yeah. Rule? Yeah, sure. That So the Pareto principle is also known as the 80, 20 rule. And it's, it's basically like a pattern that you can find in a lot of things in life. Like for example, if you like, okay, I'll just use my audiobook portfolio as an example. Like I get royalties from audiobooks that I have narrated in the past. And I would say like 80% of the royalties come from maybe 20% of the books that I've done. Like there's some that are like the top sellers, you know what I mean? And then the, 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 the rest of the 80% provide maybe 20% of the income. And you can find this pattern in a lot of stuff. And in your case, in the in the crypto tax blueprint, you were talking about like 80% of the data that you're going to be working with is probably like easy, correctly labeled, correctly formatted. It's going to be like, you know, no problem. But then 20% of the data is going to be like a real pain in the butt to get correct. And you're going to have to like do 80% of the work to work with that last 20% of the data and get it organized and fill in the gaps of missing information and stuff like that. Great analysis. Yeah. I'd say the, the Pareto principle shows up essentially in almost everything in life. Yeah. You could, you could find it somewhere applying to almost everything, you know, like even sales. It's like, okay, well, 
you break it down and say, oh, look, 80% of our revenue comes from 20% of the clients or 20% of the work from the salespeople or whatever it is. And so the next thought will be like, all right, well, then let's chop off the other uh, 20% that takes 80% of the work to get it. But the thing is, it's like Stephen Covey says, you can't pick up one end of the stick without picking up the other end of the stick. So you yeah, it's an equilibrium it. and then it disrupts the equilibrium and then it comes to a yeah, balance again. You would get it again. If you yeah. hack that piece off, you get it again in some degree. Yeah. So you can't, it's almost like it's inseparable right? To some degree. Yeah, totally. And it, the, it makes sense. Like we always want to try to maximize our efficiency. And so we, we want to get rid of that, that 20% that's dead weight and increase our, you know, our high yielding portion of whatever we're, we're working with. But um, like you said, it'll show up again. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I love, the, I love the, the high yielding portion. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's awesome. Right. Well, the, the other thing that you mentioned too, the, the relegation factor, and then also, I think what's tied into what's related to that is the is the data as an asset factor. That's what I talk about is that I think that that appears so far from the feedback I've gotten is that pe- that is an aha for people that they're mm-hmm. like, oh, I never thought about that because mm-hmm. the data is an asset. So with a crypto, everybody knows crypto is an asset, uh, monetary sovereignty, self-custody, you know, all that stuff. Everybody gets that part. Um because it's self-evident that you got these assets because you invested ultimately some funds in there and you know you're trading around and changing your portfolio around but that's the obvious piece there but the much less obvious piece is the data that goes along with that that's associated with the breadcrumb trail as to how you got there mm-hmm. and so it's not evident that it's an asset until when that you've got a gaping hole in your trans crypto transactional landscape as i like to say and then you try to work that out and you're like, wow, that is a major problem, which could result yeah. in actually it could more time and expense for you, more time and expense hiring a professional if you can even find one that could figure it out and potentially pay, having a higher tax liability to do the work around. So it could be extremely expensive. And then you realize your data is an asset. And so, yeah. And especially when you're talking about something like an exchange failure, like for example, you know, anyone who's been in the crypto world for, I mean, just in the last cup in the last year has probably experienced some kind of exchange failure or, uh, you know, if you're not self custodying your funds, you're dealing with someone else custodying your funds and it is not uncommon at all for them to fail, lose not only the funds, but the data about the funds too. And so then you're left with two problems. You, you get, you get, um, you know, two negative outcomes, which is that you lose your money, but you also lose the data about the money too. And then if you're trying to piece together a picture of your accounting, it can be really difficult without that data. And so one of the things that you advocate is like frequent backups and labeling them with what the date was and everything like that. And, and just taking screenshots, um, taking screenshots of your data, um, because you never know, like you, you kind of have to self custody that data too, as well as self custodying the funds. Yeah, that's right. And also another thing to add to that is basically your exchange is not your storage device, meaning Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about crypto storage, Bitcoin storage. I'm talking about again, data storage. Okay. Like wherever you store your files, and, but it's also, but that's also a legacy phenomenon for best practices. This isn't like, that's not like really a new thing for crypto. Like your bank account, your bank, your online banking login, that's not your data storage device, your Amex login. That's not your storage device, but most people don't archive those statements, but the same mm-hmm. thing happens. It's interesting because the one thing that happens almost universally instantly with banking, if you go close an account, when it closes, this is not necessarily with credit cards, but it's more typical with bank. You close the account, bam, it's done. Yeah. I mean, you're like, whoa, what? I, I didn't expect for it to, my, me to lose online access. It's literally, it's gone. Your statements are gone. Then what happens? You get relegated to calling the bank, requesting paper copies at $5 a statement, and then getting those statements in the mail and so on and so on. So you have to archive all that stuff before you close yeah. it, especially for a business because you got to have those records. So but yeah, that's what the, happens. I, I can tell you, I mean, a recent example, Bittrex just shut down. Mm-hmm. I guess they got whacked by a uh, Wells notice or whatever with the SEC. And um, so they started sending out messages, you know, we're closing the Bittrex for U.S. customers. 
And of course, you know, like I have a stealth email that was associated with the account. So I'm not looking at it all the time because it's, it's stealth for login purposes. So it just so happened that something triggered me to go in there. I was like, oh, look, it's like two weeks away. And I, I would have missed it because it just had April the 29th was when Bittrex shut down. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I would have missed it. But fortunately, now one thing was there's only like 200 hours of assets. So I was, you know, applying the golden rule of not keeping the assets on the exchange. But I could have lost in that case, the $200 wouldn't have been a big deal. Mm-hmm. But the potential loss of the data, I don't know how far back it went in that case, but the potential loss of data could have been much more expensive. Yeah, absolutely. And it gets really complicated when you have multiple exchange accounts like this. And then like within the last year, there's been so much, so many closures of like, um, you know, custodial places where people store crypto assets. And it can be a real mess because especially if you're not logging in often or if you're just kind of like, you know, forgetting about it, or if you're not monitoring your email really closely, you're going to, you're not going to be grabbing that data. And so it's a problem. And, and like, you're right. I, I even had this experience, like you, when you were saying that this is not just a problem with crypto um, assets, this is also like with legacy bank accounts too. I had this business bank account that the bank was actually closing and shutting down and like like I didn't even close the account they were letting us know that they were closing it and they yanked everything offline like a week after they closed and so I had to grab all those statements and stuff and it was it was quite annoying like sorting that out <laughs> so yeah that is another great example right there absolutely yeah. so uh, you know so what happens is uh you know I think one of the big big so I you know I think that Missing transactions, talking about 80-20 and everything else, missing transactions is something that happens. Everybody's got it to some degree. Some and for some people it's a lot more major, and maybe some people it's a lot less. Now, if you're like if you're a noob and you're just getting into the game, some people might say, Well, I've never lost any data yet. You know, but somebody might yeah, have just a give it base. some time. I mean, yeah. If yeah, you- exactly. It's a matter of time. <laughs> it's going to happen in some form or fashion or another. Yeah. You will lose data. You will not have data. And that's the other thing too. Like this maybe didn't capture this fully in the book, but there's other examples where, you know, there's some platforms where you can't even get the data. It's, it just blows my mind actually. actually. Actually, I mean, I do talk about the terrible state of data. Like if you had to grade the entire crypto space for the, for the you know, grade the, the data, like how it's mm-hmm. presented and the format and like all that thing. If you just had the great overall grade is like a D and I've never seen that change my whole time <laughs> in crypto. So, but there's some places you can't even get the data. Like there's some like gaming platforms and stuff where it's in there and like, mm-hmm. you can't really get it. And you're like, you got to go through this whole forensic exercise, but that's a lot of what this is about. So like anytime you got missing transactions, anytime you have any special issues and you can end up, it's not just missing transactions. You can actually have gaping holes what I'm saying here is from other reasons, not just not from your carelessness, your own carelessness, or yeah. not from, you know, one of the exchanges you're relying on, not from them going down. There could be several reasons you get there, you end up there, but nonetheless, then you get into a situation where you have to kind of attempt to forensically reconstruct what happened to the best of your ability. That's what you want to stay away from. That should be the motivator. That's kind of part of the message too. Like if you, cause sometimes you're like, all right, well to do this, you know, one of the messages here is conservatism. So if you have a, so if you can narrow down what the possibilities are and you can say, all right, well, I, I need to, I'm going to take the most conservative path here, mm-hmm. right? For let's say IRS or whatever your respective tax agency is. I'm going to take the conservative position because that's what I have to do rather than, you know, because based on what I have or what I don't have. And, um, so that that could that could force you under you know end up uh, having to pay higher tax from that. So basically, if you go through the pain of going through the gauntlet of missing transactions, it could be a good thing in the in the sense that you experience it. You go, well, I don't want to have that happen again. I'm going to get on this. I'm going to follow the crypto tax blueprint and make sure I, you know, manage all my stuff and archive mm-hmm. it properly and organize it and that kind of thing. Yeah, I like what you said in the book about that. This is like one of the costs of crypto that is, I mean, it it can be a pain. You can look at it that way, but think about all the other benefits of crypto and you'll see that, you know, just getting used to doing this kind of accounting work is 
not necessarily like something that would make you want to stop using crypto. Maybe for some people it would, but I don't think definitely not for me or for a lot of other people out there. That's right. Yeah. It, it might, it might seem like there's like a, wow, this is, this is a lot to deal with, especially if somebody was like to pick this up, who's like getting in the game and they want to pre be proactive and be like, all right, I want to, I want to see what, I, what I'm getting into and what I will need to manage. Mm -hmm. It's not discouraging at all. It's just, that's the way it is. But yeah, there's, there's so many fun things in crypto. It's like, all right, it's just another thing that there is to manage. So yeah. And it's, it's part of that. It's part of that personal responsibility, you know, like it's, the path to, I mean, uh, the path to slavery is paved with convenience, right? It's like, if you don't take responsibility for, for doing things yourself, then you can end up depending on other people for them. And that isn't always necessarily a good thing, right? Like, you know, it's crypto teaches lessons about, about sort of taking responsibility for your, for your data, for your security, for your uh, finances for, you know, all kinds of things. And um, it just goes with the territory. And I think you can, you can even apply that to other areas of life, like taking more responsibility for providing for everything you need is, um, I think is, is like a very good and empowering thing. Man, you just nailed it right there. That was awesome. So take, <laughs> not to get too philosophical or anything, but that like, was awesome. I've taking been more responsibility. And yeah. Crypto teaches us lessons because that is exactly it. I think you totally, you totally know it because what it makes me think of is, you know, like crypto has helped me stuff, but like, what has it done for me? Mm -hmm. It's helped me. One of the, one of the many things or one of the top points is it helped me step up my game mm -hmm. in many different ways. And when I say my game, I mean, my overall game, like just the way I handle security. Like if you, cause I fully embrace the decentralized ethos and self custody and all that. Right. That's my, I'm on that end of the spectrum. Yeah. So from that point of view, I had to step my game up with security and not only learning the things about crypto, but then there's the other things that go along with it. Like just, you know, just there's kind of some legacy security elements that are in there as well, but the use of emails and all that stuff without going into the rabbit hole about security, which that's, I think that's the next book project, but um, mm -hmm. so you know, but it's, that's what I've learned because I think that's, that's what you talk about the responsibility piece. I think the reliance on the third parties mm -hmm. has generally uh, enabled people to be more lazy about the, how they operate their affairs and how they manage stuff. Cause it's like, ah, oh, you know, whatever. Oh, I can't get into this site. Uh, let me just ping customer support. And I got no password manager. Or I'd like whatever the worst case scenario is for managing credentials and stuff. And it's like, and that's how people operate. I'll just go ask them for help. Like that's the old model. The new model is basically when you 100% custody, that means you are 100% responsible for everything across yeah. the board, which to some people, it could be intimidating. But to me, it's like, this is what we've been waiting for. So that's yeah, how, it's, so it's really me, about, it's, I've gotten the gift of the, to me, the gift that this has given me is I've stepped up my game to an entirely different level. And I wouldn't be here that way if it wasn't for crypto. So I, I love the idea of being hundred percent responsible. Like I said, uh, this is like my, how it occurs to me is this is what we've been waiting for. Not, ev not everybody has that, but that's how it is for me. Absolutely. I mean, um, I, I couldn't agree more. Like, I think it's, it's also changed my life in the, in a similar way, like, um, you know, being my own bank got me thinking about like being my own grocery store. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> and and yeah, like I'm doing that too now. So, I mean, well, say, always... say more about that. What do you mean by being a gr your own grocery store? Well, I've, I've gotten really interested lately over the past couple of years in producing more of my own food. And I've learned so much about gardening and homesteading, building projects and structures, um, raising poultry, like, you know, there's, there's all kinds of things. Um, and it, it's made me feel so good. Like, um, you know, we're kind of just going into the growing season here. It's like, it's May, May the 4th, May the 4th be with you. Um, <laughs> this year, this year, the growing season is just kind of um, off to a start. But last year I was able to produce like more of my own food than I've ever done in my life. And it was such an amazing, meaningful feeling to do that. And I don't want to stop now. Um, 
this has empowered me That's in awesome. a way. I love it. Yeah, like, and, and it was actually a similar feeling that I had with when I first learned about Bitcoin. I was like, wow, this is like money that's really mine that I don't have to ask anyone if I can really use. Like, I, I remember these feelings of like, you know, putting money in the bank and thinking like, is this really mine? Like, can I really like do like whatever I want with this? And the answer is no, you can't do really whatever you want with it, right? Like <laughs> um, you can't have like much privacy. Like they can sometimes like, you know, say, no, nope, you can't do that or whatever. Um, and so, but but Bitcoin, it was like money that's, it's really yours. And if you've never experienced that, especially if you've come from a culture or if you've had circumstances in your life where where you've been kind of like controlled or oppressed by other people, um, you know, it's it's an amazing feeling to really feel like something is your own and you can do whatever you want with it. Um, but with that power comes responsibility too. And taking that responsibility and really embracing it is very empowering as well. I love it. So there you go. See the strategic byproduct of stepping up your game in crypto is that all of a sudden you, it spills over into these other areas of your life. Thanks for listening to part one of the making of the crypto tax blueprint. Please tune into part two, where we continue the discussion. You'll be glad you did. Please smash the like button and subscribe to the channel and check out the links in the description.